Now, enough of this idle chit-chat. It's time for some serious music. This man is my living icon. Last week, his new classical work, Eke Cormeum, premiered at the Royal Albert Hall. In a very special interview, Verity Sharp spoke to Sir Paul McCartney. There are dark times in every great artist's life, and for Paul McCartney, this is surely one of them. The man who gave us Let It Be, Yesterday, and All You Need Is Love has written a mournful choral work for Magdalen College, Oxford. It took him eight years to write. When the piece was commissioned, his wife Linda was fighting cancer, and within 18 months, she was dead. In the 29 years of their marriage, they famously spent just one night apart. But then it seemed the bad times were over. Britain's favourite widower met a new girl to make him happy. Her name was Heather Mills. Four years later, in the midst of their painful divorce, Paul McCartney has chosen to finally premiere his oratorio, Ecce Cormeum, or in English, Behold My Heart. He declined to talk about Heather, but he did talk about the feelings behind his music. In the middle of Ecce, there's uh, the lament um, that was putting into music my feelings after the death of Linda. There's like a therapeutic thing, and there is a sort of, um, it, it helps you. You know, I often found that if I had an argument or something, then I'd go off and rather than just sit and sulk, go off and play guitar. And you work it out. You know, some melody comes and sort of encourages you to feel better about the world and you go back and you stop the argument. It took you eight years in total to write, didn't it? And when Linda died, did you actually stop writing it or mm. stop writing altogether? Did you kind of go through a period yeah, of Yeah, I did. You know, it was just such uh, a sad event for me and the family that um, it knocked us for six, obviously. And, yeah, I couldn't really do much at that time. Mm. I think I was just spending too much time grieving, which I think in the end was the right thing to do. Was she actually ill when you started writing it? I think she was. It was just the start of things, yeah. And, yeah, so when she actually died, it, it, uh, it was very difficult and I couldn't do anything. But the, I think the first thing I did was that slow lament. And my friend and I, Keith, he remembers the two of us just sitting at the keyboard, just weeping, you know, with what I was writing. And it still has that effect on me. I can hear it and... Your mum died of cancer, didn't she, when mm. you were 14? And that, was that not when you first ever picked up a guitar to kind of express grief? Yeah, it was around about that time, yeah. And the, the thing was then, of course, that um, I'd just met John and he'd lost his mum around mm. about that time. So the two of us had this thing in common. Um, and I think it did in some way put us both into music without realising I don't think we ever sat down and said, we're into music just because we lost our mums. But looking back on it, I'm sure that was something to do with it. Eke Cormeum was commissioned by Magdalen College Oxford to mark the building of their new concert hall. They requested a piece that would be as popular with choirs as Handel's Messiah. For McCartney, who doesn't read or write music, the composition posed a major technical challenge. Writing a melody for a sort of three or four minute pop song and then writing a four movement oratorio, mm. it's quite a different thing, isn't it? Do you kind of seek advice on how to structure it or, you know? Oh, yeah. I can know a melody and I can put it, because I've got a synthesizer that can do anything, so I can put my melody on, let's say, a French horn and I can go out of his range and somebody therefore has to say to me, he won't be able to play that, so why don't you do this? And you revised Eke after the first performance, yeah. the initial performance, the Maudlin performance. It needed so, quite some revising, actually. I did it originally for the, the, the boys' choir for Maudlin, and so we tried it out there. And the, uh, the little boy who had the lead treble part couldn't come on the second half. I'd overdone it. Oh, you know, I'd just written too much for him. I thought, this sounds great! And the poor little kid, <laughs> flaking out. So I had to go back and think, wait a minute, got to give the kid a rest and the other kids. If I was to take lessons, those are the kind of lessons it would be good to know. Eke Cormeum has divided the critics, just like Paul McCartney's previous ventures into classical music. In 1991, he surprised his pop fans with The Liverpool Oratorio, an autobiographical work that premiered at Liverpool Cathedral. He 
followed this in 1997 with Standing Stone, a choral piece that explored his Celtic roots. Did Linda love classical music? She did. She's like me. She loved certain uh, uh, pieces. We kind of knew the more popular repertoire that people know, but weren't very knowledgeable about it. Um, but you know, I come from a family uh, where my dad at home, he was more of a jazzer. He was into 20s jazz, you know, and you, you'd get on the BBC, there'd, there'd be um, some classical music with, he said, get that bloody stuff off. <laughs> and he'd go right to the radio, turn it off. So that was my classical education. <laughs> Not very promising. As I started to get into writing and did things like Yesterday and uh, Eleanor Rigby, Eleanor Rigby. that I started to appreciate working with um, orchestral musicians. I think it, it, at first we were a bit in awe of them. You know, wow, you know, they're real musicians and we're not. <laughs> in fact, there was a, a weird little thing on the ear of my recording desk that on the end of the desk, it used to have a little lever, tiny little thing, and it used to say, pop or classical. And we used to get quite uptight. We said, what have they got that we haven't? <laughs> what are you giving these classical people? Yeah. <laughs> Years after it, it was explained to us, you know, it's, it's just a different kind of EQ. You know, in pop, we use a more trebly kind of EQ. Classical, it's a more smooth. Yeah. You know, all right. And, yeah. But uh, it was us and them, definitely. But then we started working with them and realized they're all people, they love music. And actually, as time's gone by, the, the two worlds have come together. There's still that funny old world, though, of classical music criticism, mm. which can be a bit of a lion's den. Mm. I think, can't it? I mean, does that, how does it strike you? Because you know, do you feel that you are perceived as a pop musician who's yeah, now trying I'm his sure. hand at oh, writing Well, I don't mind music. that, you know, because that's where I came from and that's who I am. You know, I still go on tour as a pop musician, so I'm proud of that. I, I, you know, I think, you know, if you want any answers, you, you look at uh, some of the records we've made. You know, with, with the Beatles particularly, and then with Wings, and since, and I think there's some good composing in there, whether you like it or not. I mean, why should I keep out of their field if someone asks me to do it? Particularly, there's my excuse right there. Um, but also, I think that's just, that's pure snobbery. It's like, you know, because you weren't classically educated, you shouldn't be attempting to write this. In the same way, does, does sort of being Paul McCartney get in the way of what you actually want to do, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I think so. You know, it, it's, um, but on balance, it's good. You know, in the, in the early days of the Beatles, you could see it coming. You could see this fame coming like a tidal wave. I had to make a decision. Do I want to just keep my privacy and, and be a private person and get on some other way in life? Or do I like this too much to stop? And that was the decision I made. Mm. So then you have to take what people got the price of fame. You have to live with it, you know, and realize that, for instance, the critic who's going to criticize me or the journalists are going to uh, write stuff about me that I wouldn't like. They're just doing their job, and I have to allow them that freedom and try and take it with a pinch of salt or a bag of salt. Mm. Plus, you know, I, I feel very lucky to have this as a job. When, you know, I used to be a coil winder at, Ma at Massey and Coggins, <laughs> um, you know, I did used to stand in front of a lathe all day. Do, 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 boom, a bit more coil. Do, do, do. So it beats that. Paul McCartney has been a cultural icon since his early 20s. Now, aged 64, with his personal life dissected by the newspapers, he seems determined to direct our attention to his first love, music. So, beneath the media frenzy, is there a message in Eke Cormem? Really, in some ways, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extended love song. It's, it's talking about love most of the time. Um, it's the hippie's dream, you know, it's peace and love. It's, it's what I still believe in. I think it's what a lot of people still believe in. So if there's a message in just a couple of words, it would be that. 
moving stuff from Maka. I'll be voting for him as my living icon. Who are you going to vote for as yours? If you want to vote for him or any of our other icons, you can cast your vote by phone 09015 or text ICON followed by the surname of your favourite to 83199. For a reminder of the 10, go to our website at bbc.co.uk slash culture show.